Good evening. It, it is evening, right? Because this is the sixth time I'm, I've been up here, and it, it kind of all runs together. But I, I want to say, and I, w- I want to first and foremost say this, uh, man, that was awesome again. Like, I, I don't want that to become cliche, but for some reason, sitting there and listening to all of you and listening to that once again, thank you for setting that up. Um, man, the band was incredible. The singing was incredible. And, and once again, uh, I can totally tank this thing and King Jesus was worshiped. Um, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is incredibly simple. And there's probably not going to be one thing that I say that you haven't heard before. And so once again, I'm not going to say anything new. I'm going to say something ancient. There's nothing uh, tonight that we need to innovate. Everything we talk about tonight needs to be imitated. And so uh, just really super excited to be here again this evening with all of you. Thanks, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to all of you that have stuck with me for the sixth talk, for heaven's sake. Um, and there's three more to go, and, and tomorrow's going to be the best day. And, and just uh, for those that are ministers, pastors in the room, preachers in the room, uh, I'm going to do something uh, tomorrow uh, th- that I'm kind of doing for you guys, because when we say that we actually live this thing out, like today I gave a lot of practical disciple-making things that can be done. And one of the reasons why disciple-making is incredibly difficult, it is an investment in time, right? It really, it really is. Um, I, I've said it several times from up here, my phone blows up when I'm up here. I, there are people that I'm involved in their lives and I hear things that are going on. I got wonderful news while sitting at the table with the gentleman tonight. There was a, a man that we had to do uh, kind of an intervention with and he followed through on everything that we said because he had ropes around him and I have to believe that the marriage is going to be restored and so many great wonderful things because we actually do what we say we do even though it's messy sometimes, and that makes it very difficult to write sermons, okay? Uh, It really does. It takes a long, long time. So it's tomorrow during the second session, uh, after I do the first session, I'm going to do something that we do uh, to cut down the sermon writing time so that we're still delivering impactful uh, sermons and, and feeding the sheep, so to speak, and making sure that the word is open, but it frees us up to actually meet Uh, with other folks. Would you believe that we only talk about Sunday morning on Tuesday morning? That's the only time we talk about Sunday morning as a staff in our church. Now, our worship director, I'm sure that she's, you know, she's all weak with it, right? But as far as uh, the the preacher and and the rest of the staff, Tuesday morning, that's it. And and I'm going to talk more about that in the morning. So just want to offer that to you. If, if I'm just trying to provide all the value that I possibly can while we're here. Um, we're very simple. We're not all that slick. Um, and so I can keep saying that because I would love to tell you where they're like these great leaders and strategists and everything. And basically all we're doing is just going, well, this is what Jesus said to do. So why don't we just go do that and see what happens, right? And, and so far, it's, it's, been wor- it's been working for a few thousand years, by the way. So uh, last year, I t- or last night, last year, see, we're a year, it's, it's, it's over. Last night, I told you that I've had a, just a really fantastic life, and, and there's been time, you heard my story today, I've been in Africa, I, like, there, I get whooshed all over the world, and then I wonder how I got where I got, and then I, and I stand around and look around, like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? I'm supposed to learn something, or they're supposed to learn something from me. And so I had something recent, like within the last few months happened to me that was kind of like this. Um, I got a call from a woman whose son uh, used to play for me. And um, uh, I had the opportunity to disciple this young man. He was led to the Lord, baptized in my pool. uh, And he's gone on to the Air Force. I mean, this was years ago. And he's gone on. uh, He was in the United States Air Force. He's actually gotten out of that. He's married. He's got a kid. And life is great for him. But his mom went to work for this organization. Uh, It's a Christian men's organization. She's an event planner for them. She was she was my team mom. She's very detail oriented, and so she she called me and she said, "Hey, David, I'm a part of this organization, and um, it's amazing, and it's got your name written all over it." I'm like, "Okay, well, well, what are we talking about here?" She said, "Well, it's it's kind of a, a cross between Navy SEAL training and church." 
And she said, it's everything that you used to do with the football guys, everything that you used to teach with them. And it's kind of a niche organization because there's not too many like former Marines coach types that are pastoral. And I was like, I don't know any of those. Oh, me. <laughs> right. And she said, we would really like for you to come up and be an instructor for this event. And uh, so so here's the deal. Since I've been in ministry, I mean, every, everybody still calls me coach, but every now and then I miss being Coach Nelson. I miss that guy because um, I really didn't have to care about people's feelings as much as I have to <laughs> now. You know, like I, I have to get through all the feelings and then we get to the stuff, right? So anyway, uh, so I was invited to come to this deal and they gave me the program. I was like, all right, we can do this, right? And so one of, the, so for the event that I was doing, was for Christian business owners. The price point for this thing was $6,000. $6,000. So the men that came to this were millionaires, business owners. One of them was famous, and I'm not going to tell you who he was, but I was like, that's, and he's here for this with me. And so one of the uh, exercises that we did, because it's interesting that even Christian business owners that are wealthy struggle in their marriage, their kids are a wreck, um, they, they feel themselves constantly being pulled away by the cares of the world and the business, and they want something different for their lives, so they pay a ton of money for this really radical, torturous thing where they learn a lot about themselves and kind of how they do life and what works and what doesn't, and I was just honored to get to ask to come up there, so I came up there. And so they did this, uh, this, there was this exercise called Details Matter. And uh, if you were with me today, I talked about, like, one of the things I kind of live by is how you do anything is how you do everything. And that's not necessarily true. Like, I'm never going to be a great opera singer, but that doesn't mean I'm not a great something else. But basically what that does mean is typically our patterns in life show up everywhere, Right? And so what we, that, that's what this exercise was designed to do. So these are grown men, millionaires, uh, business owners lined up on a line. And we set something up in the back with these like exercise bags with these individual sandbags. And uh, so we, we got them on the line and we said this. Okay, what you are going to do is you are going to run back to those piles. You are going to grab a sandbag, fill it with three smaller sandbags. You are going to zip it all the way closed. You are going to take this tie and tie it to that buckle, and then you are going to bring it back, present it at your feet on the line, and you have one minute. Does everybody understand? Yes, we understand. Somebody repeat it back to me. Blah, 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 Do the tie and the buckle and the thing and present it at our feet one minute. Did he get it right? Yes, he got it right. Okay. One minute. Go. Here they go. Man, they run. They go get it. Yeah, it's sandbags. I mean, it's, it's just like a melee back there. Like, ah. And, of course, uh, some of them got back on time, and then a minute passes, and there's several of them that didn't. Okay, well, um, you didn't make it, so go reset. So they go reset, and then we do it again, right? And then this time, you know, after about an hour, they finally made it in a minute. And then we inspected all the stuff, and the zippers weren't done correctly, the buckles weren't done correctly, and so we would, you know, all right, well, go reset. So after about an hour and a half, we look back where they reset, and they started creating shortcuts for themselves to make it. There was a lesson in that. All right, man, just take a look at what you've done back there. Just look at what you've done. Is that how we told you to set it up back there? We said that those sandbags were to be in one pile and that other, you know, all that. And so where else does this show up in your life where you're not getting the job done so you take shortcuts? Right? And like these are grown men, millionaires paying to be tortured like this and they're like, oh. so you go reset that the way we told you. And so this keeps going on and they keep presenting and now they start to infight. Like the guys that finish start getting mad at the guys that don't finish. And then like this, it's this ugly, awful, awful thing. And these grown men, millionaires at the top of their game are almost fist fighting. There's a lesson in that. So once it was all kind of said and done, we, we cut the bull. And we said, listen, 
Here are the details. The details matter. You keep missing details. So here are the details one more time. You are to go back there. You are to fill your sandbag with three smaller sandbags. You are to zip it completely. You are to tie the buckle. You are to do all of those things. And you are to get back here and you are to present it at your feet. But instead of a minute, you have 45 seconds. And guess what happened? They did it. They did it. Um, so all of that got corrected, and they actually did it. And the reason why they were able to do it this time is because uh, they focused on the task at hand. They focused on the task, not on themselves, not on the performance of the others, and they didn't focus so much on the time. Because it's kind of weird, but that 60 seconds was actually a hindrance to them. Because when we lessened the time, they got more focused on the details. So there's a lesson in all of that, uh, in all of that for us. The details matter. And focusing on the wrong things will get us beat. So now, I, I don't know if your church experience was anything like mine growing up. Uh, but when I started applying the lessons, uh, the men at this experience started to be figuring out in their own lives to the church, I began to squirm because I, I work in church ministry now and I started thinking about details matter and I started going, whew. And so uh, I don't know if your experience growing up in the church was anything like mine, um, but the experience that I had, I came from a very conservative a cappella Church of Christ in the Bible Belt of Texas. It's a restoration movement church, so not dissimilar from you guys at all, but what my growing up experience was very conservative, and we were very self-focused. We were self-focused. And I remember that we referred to ourselves as the church. We were the church. Oh, are they a member of the church? No, they're Presbyterian. Oh, well, they're not in the, the church, right? I, I'm not making fun of that. We said that. Um, I remember that we thought that we were the only ones going to heaven for a time. I remember that was kind of the thing. And we had the right name, we had the right theology, and we had a d desire to know more than everyone, which is not always a bad thing. We had it right, the others didn't. That was our identity, which leads me to the next point. Maybe you noticed growing up that... Um, we were focused too much on what others were doing. Uh, I remember hearing sermons <laughs> about the other denominations um, down the street worshiping with instruments, right? Because we were a cappella, like I said. They were worshiping with instruments, and we would have sermons within our church that would say that. And I'm not making fun. I'm just I'm making a point with this. That, that if we're going to work with instruments, we, or we're going to worship with instruments, we might as well just sacrifice bulls and burn incense. I heard that. And I, I remember that, you know, there's heads nodding, like, yeah, we should do that. Yep. I also remember that we basically neutered the work of the Holy Spirit in our response to the charismatic movement. Um, we, we took a passage from 1 Corinthians, or not, yeah, from 1 Corinthians 13, a passage about love, and made it say that there are no longer Holy Spirit things happening because we have the Bible. Because the perfect has come, we no longer need the Holy Spirit. Like, and, and I just want to throw this out. Uh, I think all of that was meant well, except that um, when would we need the Holy Spirit more than now, right? The whole, this is, the whole church is the Holy Spirit's thing. Now, when Jesus comes back, we're not going to need, you know, uh, it was, it's kind of funny that one of the things that says we'll cease is knowledge. Well, I think we need knowledge right now, don't you? I don't think that we need to cease that. And so I, I don't think that those gifts of the Spirit have ceased because the Bible's come. I think the Holy Spirit and the Bible and the church is why we have the best manifestation of God possible, right? I said that last night. And uh, so don't get me started on the sermons that we preached about the Catholics, right? <laughs> um, once again, I, I'm not making fun. Here's why I speak this lamentation. 
I think of all the time that was focused on other people. Why were we preaching that to our own people when we should have been equipping them to make disciples? Right? That's what we should have been doing. And so here's the, the saddest part. Sadly, it didn't take long until we started focusing on the people within our own tribe. Right? Uh, kitchens. Children's homes, worship styles, water fountains, and other silly things that may not have been mentioned in the Bible became worthy of debate all of a sudden. And in some cases, necessities for splitting churches. I know of hundreds who have fallen away because of the hurt this caused, and I know some of the instigators don't care about the carnage that they have caused, and they blame those who got hurt for, and that they got what they deserved. It's a travesty. I keep using the word treason against the kingdom of God, right? Another thing we focused on was, um, yeah, we, we just didn't have urgency, very, very much like uh, this details matter exercise that I was talking about. We didn't have any urgency at all. And one of the things that the apostles seemed to understand was that the resurrection of Jesus signified the beginning of the last days. And that doesn't mean the end times. I said that last night. But it does mean that there isn't anything else coming beyond the work of the Holy Spirit in the church now. Jesus will be returning, but there isn't going to be another covenant or testament. Jesus is the way. He said, be ready. Details matter. So I'm, I'm just, I'm begging you, like I'm hoping, like maybe y'all can encourage me from the stage. Please tell me that none of this is happening anymore. Please tell me that we are past all of that. Please tell me that we are only focused on the mission of King Jesus and nothing else. Please tell me. Are we? Oh no, nobody said anything. Hmm. All right. So, so maybe tonight I'll help with that, okay? Maybe we can get to the details. So shifting gears, I want you to think about yourself on the deathbed, and I'm not being morbid here, like we're only going to be here for a minute. Think about yourself on your deathbed. You have your closest family gathered around you, and you've got just a few more breaths to tell them something really important. What would you say? Would you tell them how to live? Would you tell them something you didn't mean? Like, would you use those breaths to say something you don't mean? Would you say something, um, you know, you, you'd probably say the most important thing imaginable. You wouldn't say something unimportant. You wouldn't tell a joke. I don't know, some, some of us, but I might. I don't know. But this is where we have Jesus as he's about to ascend back into heaven, and he gives us one more command before he ascends. I'm inclined to believe this is the most important of them all. He's not on his deathbed because he's alive. But until he comes back, but until he, we feast with him, until we partake, we get to partake with communion with Jesus soon, right? And this is going to be awesome. I can't wait for that. But before that moment, he says something to us. And I really want to know um, what would happen if we focused on the task that he gives us. And not on ourselves, and not on the performance of others, and not on the time that we have left. If we were to speak where the Bible speaks, and what Jesus desires of us, it is very clear what we're about to read. Details matter. Focusing on the wrong things will get us beat. So once again, I want to start by reading the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. I, we, I talked about that last night. We are good, ladies and gentlemen. Like, that's, that's really all we need to know about the things going forward. Wouldn't you agree? Like, did we all come to agreement last night that Jesus being in authority of all things, like, that's great. We, we have no better advocate. All authority on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Put on my jersey. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God bless the reading of his word. I mean, lesson over. There it is. Hey, there's Jesus' last words. He said, go do that. 
Really, at the, like that's it. Seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? We have one central command in that middle clause. The one central command is make disciples. You are to make disciples. Uh, we are also given three participles, and I can get, like I'm an English nerd, I could get into all the participles, uh, but we actually have three participles within this statement about this. Um, how to make disciples is by going, by baptizing, and by teaching, right? By going, by baptizing, and by teaching. This is how the manifold wisdom of God is taught throughout the world to the principalities and authorities in the heavenly realms. This is how we and others become rooted and established in his love, that we may have the strength to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of Jesus' love. This love surpasses knowledge. It's more than anything that we can possibly know, which seems to be um, all that many of us are after these days. We just want to know more. And I said something, I, I can't remember when I said it, so if you heard it, you're going to hear it again. Uh, we need to get away from the idea that spiritual maturity is knowing enough that we don't need anybody else. That is not spiritual maturity. And the more spiritually mature you become, the more that you should realize not, that not only do you need somebody pulling you up, you need somebody to pull up with you. That's spiritual maturity, and it requires more of others, not less. So, this is God's plan A. You want to know what God's plan A is? That's plan A. Guess what there is not one of? There's no plan B. So if you're waiting for a revival to happen in Canada, guess what God's plan for a revival is? It's plan A. So why is the church neglected to do this? Uh, we can say the same thing in the States, but I'm in Canada, so I'm advocating for you guys right now. Why is the church neglected to do this? Why, when Jesus says the kingdom is like a mustard seed that will grow into a tree where birds roost in its branches, uh, and there, by the way, there's no going back. You can't make a tree into a seed again. Why do Christians use terms like post-Christian? I've actually heard it several times since I've been here. Well, we're kind of living a post-Christian society. I want to encourage you with something right now. Listen to the sound of my voice. There is no such thing as a post-Christian society because he is the alpha and he is the omega. There is nothing coming after him. He is, has all authority. Does that, does that resonate with you? Okay, thank, I mean, thank you because I want you all to hear that. Like there is nothing that is going to be beyond Jesus Christ. And even those folks that we think that may have moved on from him, every single one of their knees are going to bow before him. Every one of them. So I did a little research, and I've come up with three empirical reasons. There's actually more, but these are the ones that I have personally observed, and that's what makes it empirical. Three empirical reasons why the church is neglected to disciple. Okay? So here they are. One, we have a lack of strategy. We just have, we have a lack of strategy. And sadly, we live in a time where most of us were never even discipled. And I would love to do the thing where I ask you, uh, raise your hand if you were ever discipled. D don't do it. God bless you, sir. I mean, that, that's really, really great. Um, because I'm going to tell you what, uh, being in the work that we're in and, and being a part of real life, we get asked to talk to a lot of folks. And I, I will tell you, one of the questions that we ask pastors, especially, I'll sit across from a pastor and I will ask him, Hey, um, great talking to you, and we're so glad that you're interested in, in talking about this discipleship thing. Uh, let me start off with this. Who are you currently discipling? What do you mean? I mean, like, who, who is it that you are personally investing in uh, so that they learn more about the kingdom and become a more Christian and they're able to produce their own disciples? He's like, and, and, he, and I can think of one man in particular that was in, it was in Florida. His name, was, I'm not going to say his name. We will call him Michael. Uh, Michael started crying just at the question. Who are you discipling? He started crying. But his tears weren't because he wasn't discipling anyone. His response to me was, I've never been discipled myself. No one has ever discipled me. 
And how would a pastor even begin to equip his entire congregation in discipleship if he's never had it modeled for him? It's easier, and this was the conclusion that he had for me. He said, it's easier for me, actually what he said, if I'm quoting correctly. He said, David, you don't understand. I have to crush it every week with my sermon. I have to crush it every week. I have to knock their socks off every week just to get enough money in the plate so I can outsource the discipleship. And I'm sure he's not alone in that because I've actually had that conversation several times. So he's like, man, I spend six hours reading it in the original Greek because my people need, you know, they love that when I do that. And then I spend the, about 30 hours uh, writing the sermon. And he goes, I have to crush it every week or no discipleship takes place. That's how he set up his life. And to do anything different would require a notable shift that would be difficult for him. So a lack of strategy. So there's churches that don't have a strategy. There's a lack of belief. And this is one that we don't necessarily like talking about. But how many Christians do you know, and this is one of those, hey, if we're being honest, how many Christians do you know that the only reason that they are Christians is because they don't want eternal punishment? They believe in case there actually is a God, not because that they know that there is one who pursues them and loves them and is chasing them like a pack of wolves with goodness and mercy, like, yo, there it is, right? Because that's what's happening. As churches, we must stop operating as if we uh, get together every week to study about God's power in the past tense once again. Jesus himself says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and the greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. I said that last night, and he said, whoever, and that means us, too. Do you want to see great things? We must do what he did. But here's the third empirical reason, and this is the most important. I didn't write them in order of preeminence. Uh, I wanted this one to land with you. The number one reason, according to discipleship.org, Bobby Harrington, y'all may know him. I mean, like, this is, this is where I got this, and, and I'm on there quite a bit. Uh, the number one reason why churches don't disciple is this. Indifference. Meh. Indifference. Charles Spurgeon. I don't agree with everything Charles Spurgeon ever said, but I agree with a lot of it, especially as he uh, talked about men and men's work, because that's primarily what I'm a part of. But Charles Spurgeon was once asked by a student whether those who had ever heard about Jesus could be saved or who had never heard about Jesus could be saved. And he said, that's a troubling question indeed. But even more troubling was whether we, knew, we who knew the gospel and were doing nothing to bring it to the lost could be saved. So discipleship.org in their own studies has concluded that indifference is the number one barrier to discipleship nowadays. And I'm, I just want you to hear this statement when I read it because I trembled when I wrote it. We don't really care if other people go to hell as long as we don't. We don't really care if others are transformed. So now thinking about the uh, soil types from Matthew 13 that we've been studying the past two days, um, there's only one type of soil that bears fruit. The other three do not. So I'm just asking you to take an honest look at your church. Is it bearing fruit? If not, what soil type represents it. Not understanding like the hard path, not rooted in love like the seed of, in the rocks, or distracted by the cares of the world. Now take a look at yourself individually and ask yourself the same questions. And if you're not the good soil, is it because of any of those reasons that I listed above? So now I want to encourage you. So what do we do? Like, this doesn't have to be the way it is. We can change this tonight, can't we? That's the beautiful thing about the dominion God has given us. In the free will that we have, as I said last night, we get a fresh set of mercies tomorrow morning. We can be completely different than we were today with his help. So what do we do? Here it is. Make disciples. Make learners. As we defined earlier, the definition of a disciple is in the invitation in Matthew 4.19. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Therefore, a disciple is one who follows Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. 
Jesus will make you into a fisher of men. Let's not overcomplicate this. There is God's part, there is the other's part, but there is our part. And we are not on the hook for anyone's part but our own. So then, what is our part? Okay, I, I talked a lot about this this morning, uh, but I'm going to give you some more nuggets that you can take with you. The very first thing is this. Here's the number one thing I want to say about what our part is. We can start becoming better disciple makers by actually obeying him. Being obedient. Obey Jesus. And one of the overlooked parts of the Great Commission passage is in Matthew 28, verse 16, which says that the 11 disciples went to a mountain in Galilee to which Jesus directed them to go. Uh, that, that doesn't sound like all, that's all that important, except that it was about 80 miles away from Jerusalem where they were. So he directed them to come to this mountain to get the commission, and they traveled that distance. They obeyed. They went and did it. And if we, uh, if we don't, the disciples, if we don't obey Jesus, the disciples that we might make wouldn't be disciples of Jesus. They're probably going to be disciples of us because we should be imitating Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So obedience. And, and I just want to throw, you know, I, I get leery of throwing out stats, um, but I did, I did a, a quote. I, I don't remember one of my talks. I quoted a guy by the name of David Bennett. He's a, he's a trainer and evangelist, and he does research. And um, he said that for those adults that become Christians after 18, 92% of them come to Christ when they actually see somebody living it out. So uh, if you want a strategy for disciple making, the first thing you can start doing is being obedient to Jesus. You're going to become very peculiar and people are going to know why you do what you do. They, they may want to know hostily, but you get an opportunity to tell them. So obey Jesus is the first one. The second one, go. Like actually go. And then, no, this is, this is uh, if you want to get technical in the Greek, it is a participle. It would read more like, as you are going, make disciples. And so this is the one part of the Great Commission that's a huge barrier to some because they think they need to sell everything and move to Africa. And that's not the case. This little phrase should give you freedom because it means you can make disciples as you go about doing what you're already doing as you abide in Christ. Nothing needs to be added to your schedule. And so it can look, to, look, look like this. So here's, here's some nuggets. So here's what as you're going looks like. By a show of hands, raise your hand if you eat lunch just about every day right? So, like, that's already in your schedule. You don't have to write in, I'm going to disciple from one to three. I mean, you can. Hey, I'm going to lunch. I would like for you to come with me. Come with me. Because you eat lunch anyway. As you're going, come with me. Sit with me. Let's talk. What's going on with you, man? Uh, anybody like to go hunting? Take someone with you. You don't have to add that into your schedule. Just go hunting and take somebody with you. Allow those conversations to open up. You like going to sporting events? Take someone with you as you were going. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the study with David Bennett. Imagine how much more successful you'd be at disciple making if you just lived out obedience to Jesus Christ and as you were going, you took people with you and they got to see it. You don't have to have the Bible memorized from front to back to be able to do that. The next thing uh, that we're asked to do is to baptize. And I think this is one that we could all agree on. When someone makes a decision for Christ, we should baptize them into his death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, worth noting is the order in which baptism is placed in the commission. Go, baptize, teach. Um, and I said this this morning. For many, it's teach, baptize, and then go. Think about it. We're going to teach them everything. Okay, you made a decision. We baptize you, and then, we're, all right, we're on to the next thing. Notice the order. Go baptize and teach. So baptism is not the graduation. It is not the target. It is a target. It is a win, but it is not the win. The win now is a baptized Christian who baptizes other Christians. Can you imagine if we all shot for the same target in our churches? Sometimes we feel like they must have an understanding of all the mysteries of God before they should get baptized. 
And I've even heard some ministers congratulating themselves for refusing baptism because they hadn't fully figured it out yet. And that's a travesty. Lastly, and this is the most important one of all, teach them to observe all that I commanded. If you were here during the morning session, you heard me talk about moving from spiritually dead to spiritual infancy. In most cases, this is what happens at baptism. Sadly, this is usually where the discipleship stops. This is where it should begin. We must teach them to obey all that Christ commanded so that they can get to spiritual parenthood where they are begetting new Christians. If the Great Commission is a command, which it was, then teaching, or by the way, which it is, uh, then teaching others to obey all that is commanded would include the Great Commission. If you are not making disciples, you are not obeying all that Jesus commanded. Have you ever thought about that? Like, and you're especially not obeying the last one that he gave us. Details matter. Focusing on the wrong things will get us beat. So once again, this isn't complicated. This is something that any of us could do. This is something Jesus commanded us to do. It could be as simple as having a one-minute elevator pitch ready so you're prepared to give an answer for your faith if you were asked to live while you do. And I encourage everyone this morning to actually come up with that. And I want you all to think about that for a second, what that might look like. Because uh, 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 15 t- actually tells us, be prepared to give an answer for your faith. So if somebody was to say, why do you live like you do, do you have an answer for them? You don't have to quote scripture because they may not know it. They may not believe it. But what you can say is, you know what? I know how I was. I was, you know, think about the blind. I was blind, but now I see. Well, who did it? He did. It can be as simple as that. It could be as simple as praying that God puts people in your path to disciple instead of approaching the world like a cereal aisle. I talked about that this morning. So when I say, hey, guys, go make disciples, there's 8 billion people out there, and you're probably going, where do I start? Well, it doesn't have to be a cereal aisle. what What do you think would happen? Do you think God would answer you if you actually started praying for those people? If you started praying, Lord, show me who it is that you would like for me to disciple. Because Jesus stayed up all night praying for his. What do you think would happen? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen because this is what happens to me when I pray that prayer. And sometimes it makes me not want to pray it anymore. But when I pray that prayer, people start showing up. I start getting texts that say, hey, coach, you got a minute? Oh, man. Well, I prayed for it. Another thing I try not to pray for is patience, but I got to. I'm challenging you in that. Start praying for people. Start praying that God identifies those people and watch what happens. And test me in this. Don't test God, but test me. For pastors, um, or I, I want to say this, it could be as simple as identifying 12 people in your life that you wish to be more intentional about bringing to Christ and increasing your proximity and time as you're going. For pastors, it may mean identifying a group of men in your church that you want to intentionally pour into to make them leaders and equip them. I'm going to tell you this. I I can speak for for most men since I am one. So I'm making myself the ambassador for all of us tonight. (laughs) If a pastor would... I, I, pastors, I'm talking to you right now. I almost guarantee that if you went to one of your men and said, hey, I see something in you, I would like to invest a year in you. I would like for you to be a part of a closed group with me where I pour into you and you pour into me and we just kind of figure this thing out together. Would you be willing to do that? I bet you they'd be like, where do we, yes, where, where do we go, right? I, I would invite you to try that. Uh, for women, this goes for you too. I, I was having a lovely conversation. I can't see you out there, but I, I had a lovely conversation with a woman on the way out, and she was telling me about how she has connections with young women and that she will consider like inviting a young woman into a relationship like that. And for you wonderful people with crowns of glory, of gray, wonderful hair, who have been down the road, I'm telling you, a young woman, if you were to invite them into that kind of relationship with you, they would be like, 
Yes, a thousand times yes, because I bet you they may be craving it. You could do the exact same thing. But no matter what, some things will have to change. Because if nothing changes, then nothing changes, and we'll just keep having church and preaching sermons, and nobody will be transformed. So pastors, we have to step from behind the pulpit as mere preachers and get on the game field and start coaching our people how to do it. Because it really does start with us. And it's what we were called to do and what we signed up for. I, I would be willing to bet you got into ministry because you actually wanted to do that. And you may, may have worked into something else you don't really want to be doing. But you can make disciples. So here's, so here's some additional stats to consider. And this is from discipleship.org. And I just want you to hear the promise in this. If one disciple maker wins 30 disciple makers to the Lord in a lifetime, and Lord Jesus in a lifetime. So that sounds like a lot. But think about it. If you become a Christian at 17 and you get one a year, by the time you're 47, you could have 30. Like, that that doesn't sound too hard, right? I mean, if you're a Christian for 60 years, you got to get one every two years. But if 30 disciple makers wins wins another, uh, if wins 30 disciple makers to the Lord in a lifetime, and those 30 disciple makers win 30 in a lifetime. And those 900 win 30 in a lifetime. And those 27,000 win 30 in a lifetime. And those 810,000 win 30 in a lifetime. That 24.3 million will win 30 in a lifetime. Then 729 million. We got Canada covered already, right? Okay. Uh, we got Canada covered, and those 729 million disciple makers win 30, and then there would be 2.18 billion disciple makers uh, that win 30. We would have the entire world covered. The last person that needs to hear the gospel would have heard it, and Jesus will come back. Hallelujah. The entire world will have heard the gospel, and Jesus will return. And all of Canada could hear the gospel in a matter of years. What a difference would that would make. So I have a call to action for you. That's, that's actually up there this time because I, I did my due diligence. Write these down, and I asked you just to practice these. Pray God will identify people in your lives to disciple. Actually start doing that. Additionally, I would ask that you identify 12 people. Circle one of them as a bullseye. Circle three of them kind of as a bullseye ring. And then the rest of the 12, people that you know that you can take with you as you're going, that you would be willing to invest in. Identify your 12. And lastly, think about the places where you can take them. And sometime this week, invite them. Just invite somebody to come with you. Uh, I talked to this wonderful man, and he talked about going to have coffee. He got a letter from the kid that uh, he took to coffee, and it was the most beautiful letter. Thank you for encouraging me for this lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. You are that spark. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your great commission. Thank you for the simplicity of it, and forgive us when we don't think the details matter. You have given us the details. Help us not to focus on others. Help us not to focus on ourselves. Help us not to focus like we've got all the time in the world because, Lord, we want you to come quickly and we want to be ready. Equip us, teach us, continue to love us, forgive us when we stray off the narrow path. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us how to do this. And it's in your victorious name we pray. Amen.